start here soon. This is going to be different than my normal stream. So if you're joining um, because you normally follow me on Twitch, this is going to be a little different. Um, if you're not a regular uh, Twitch viewer, this is going to be very similar to a, a meetup, user group, conference presentation. You know, this, is, this was originally this date and time I was supposed to be, we were all supposed to be in uh, Cincinnati right now for an event called SQL Saturday. And uh, this, was the, this was the presentation I was going to give there. So when that was uh, canceled due to the whole uh, thing going on right now, I, uh, I reached out to one of the organizers and I said, I, I'm still willing to do this. I'll do it uh, virtually and people can join at the same, uh, same date and time. And uh, I'll just I'll give the same presentation. And this is kind of trying to, this is supposed to be a very interactive session. So um, I definitely want to, want you in the chat room asking questions. There's going to be a, a little bit of another way to ask questions if you want to ask and vote on questions. Um, if you don't want to log into Twitch, so if you, even if you're not logged in, you're just watching this on Twitch, that's totally fine. You can still participate. CHL Smith, how are you, CHL Smith? Uh, you've heard of Twitch. This is the first time you've gone to it. Yeah, Twitch is originally for just sort of game streaming, but in recent year or two, it's been expanding to have lots of other kinds of video content, live video content with an emphasis on, on interaction. So I think it's a great platform to try out. Uh, for this uh, session. We'll see how it goes. But I definitely appreciate you being here. Uh, and uh, we'll, again, we'll get started here in about uh, three minutes. You might have noticed when you enter a chat message, it'll pop up on the screen above my head. Um, that's that's uh, totally normal. Uh, for Twitch, so everyone everyone can see the chat messages when they're watching the recording later. For instance, this will be available um, on on Twitch for a while, and then on on YouTube. Should we just toss questions out randomly for this session? Absolutely, Jared Lawthorne. And by the way, thank you for the follow, and thank you for joining thank us today. Welcome. Hey, thank you for the follow, Zach Binks. I'm going to probably turn that feature off. I don't know, maybe not. That's kind of the fun of Twitch, is you get these little pop ups when different events happen. Hopefully it won't be too distracting. If it is too distracting, I'll turn it off. Uh, thank you for this fall, C.L. Smith. C.H.L. Smith. Yeah, and you actually, for this session, you can start asking questions right now. Um, and in fact, why don't I just go ahead and put this up on the, on the screen here. Uh, this is the very first slide for my session, is I want your questions up front. So uh, you can ask them here in, in the chat, of course, and I'll try to keep track of those. Uh, and you can also go to this website here, pigeonhole.at slash SQLSAT, all caps. And you can start asking questions there, submitting questions. I'll be viewing them uh, on my phone when we get to a, a certain part of the session. It's very much uh, a choose-your-own-adventure session. It's going to be driven by your questions. So if you don't ask questions, I'll be forced to pick where we go. So uh, I'll go ahead and enter your question there, Zach Binks, into Pigeonhole. Is SQL... Similar, a much slower typer on my phone, similar to Excel as far as code. Okay, so this is, this is, uh, this is basically a, a, a NoSQL type session, Zach Binks, but I'm still happy to answer that question. We'll talk about, talk about that. RDBMS versus, uh, versus uh, CB, I assume you mean Couchbase in that case. RDBMS versus CB. I'll put that into pigeonhole there as well. Uh, certainly, a lot of this a lot of this session is designed for people who are familiar with relational databases and have not uh, taken much of a look at NoSQL databases. So we'll definitely do a lot of that. Some of it will be about Couchbase, yes, but we're we're not going to make this completely about Couchbase. I just a disclaimer though, I do work for Couchbase. I'm a I'm a Couchbase employee, so that's the area I know I know the most and I know the best. But I'm going to do a job, a, a job a, try to do a, a good job of uh, fairly representing uh, other, other options out there. Okay, so it's 9.45. Hey, everybody. I uh, hope you got a nice, uh, a nice uh, warm cup of coffee. I hope everyone's uh, doing well out there uh, during these uh, tense times. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we'll, we'll keep this to about an hour, although if 
people still want to chat and talk and ask questions, I will be happy to um, hang around as long as you want to on this stream uh, and, and answer your question. This is meant to be a highly interactive stream. So uh, what I want to do is ask for your questions up front. And you can go to this website here, pigeonhole.at slash SQLSAT, SQLSAT in all caps. That QR code will get you there as well. There'll just be one Q&A you can join called SQL Saturday Cincinnati. And you can ask questions there. And you can do so without being logged into Twitch. You can do so anonymously. Uh, it's just a way for you to be more interactive. Uh, this, this works really well in person because not everyone wants to put, put their hand up and speak in front of the whole room and put on the spot. But it works great for virtual too because now anyone can ask a question whether or not you're logged into Twitch. So uh, I'll keep this link on every slide as we go through the session. So if you think of something pops into your mind, Write that question down, put it in here, and we'll get to a point where I'm going to start choosing which content to uh, explore and, and show you based on your questions. So we've got a couple of good questions already. We've got more coming in. It's great. Uh, so let's just get on with it then. Let's see uh, how this works. Now this might be a little strange for a lot of you, uh, maybe being on Twitch or uh, being at a, a, a session that's normally in person. But I think we're going to start out by... Uh, you know, if like me, when interacting with data, for most of your career, you've, you've used a relational database, most likely. So the, this is a question I get a lot. Why would I use NoSQL? Uh, but, and then follow up on that, why would I use this particular NoSQL or that particular NoSQL database? Why would I do it? That's sort of the main underlying question uh, behind all of this, behind any technology tool, really. Um, and, and the answer is always it depends. It's always it depends. But I'm going to go through a lot of different things, and maybe you'll see something that appeals to you or that uh, doesn't appeal to you. And it's, this is really just a starting place for you to explore technology. Obviously, you're going to need more than the slide deck to make a decision. You're going to need to actually get the technology, try it out, see how it works, does it support the tools you want, support the integrations you want, all those sorts of things. And I, I, I do want to say up front as a disclaimer, I really hate the term NoSQL. I know it's in the name of the session. Uh, I know I use it in a lot of these slides. I work for a NoSQL company. It's not a great useful term, though, uh, when talking about, um, talking about data. It, it's really only useful for saying, oh, NoSQL means something other than relational databases. And so that only defines what it isn't. And, and really, it's not even accurate anymore, as you're going to see today. Uh, NoSQL can include SQL queries now. And the last point I want to make, and I should, probably should be uh, showing these bullet points up here, is that it's using NoSQL does not mean you're anti-SQL. It just means that you recognize that databases are not one size fit all. That's that's really the core of it right there. You know, some some vendors might say, oh, we should use NoSQL for everything. Or, or we should use relational for everything. And I, I think that that's, those are both extreme point of views that vendors, of course, will say because they want you to use their, their tools. Uh, but really, it just means use the right database for the right, um, the right, uh, you know, uh, right project, the right uh, tool, the right job. So this is my agenda. And notice it's very short because most of it is number two right there, the choose your own adventure. I'm going to give you a little bit of NoSQL history because this is meant to be an introductory session. Um, but it's going to be very much driven by your questions. And so uh, just make sure to go to pigeonhole.at there and get those questions as you think of them or into, into the Twitch chat there. Either one's totally fine. So, so why, why did NoSQL even come about? What, let's talk about a little bit about database history here. So uh, if you can think back this far before we even had relational databases, and data was very much coupled to the application and the system that it was being used for. So you didn't have much of a query capability, certainly not an ad hoc query capability. So you couldn't just throw any query you wanted at it. And the, and the kind of tooling and languages you needed depends on what the system was written in. So if it was written in assembly, probably you're going to have to use assembly. Uh, written in uh, COBOL, you're going to have to use COBOL, et cetera. And you don't have much interoperability here because the databases are written specifically for the application. They're not meant to be general purpose databases. So we advanced a little further to the 1970s, and we have this guy here. His name is E.F. Codd, and he invented the relational database model back in 1970. There's a, there's a paper for that. And 
in, in those times, it was designed to be optimized for limited disk space. Disk space was very expensive and very limited. And so we have to store our data in such a way that makes sense so that it's efficiently stored to the disk. So that means no duplication. It means no, no, nothing that we don't absolutely need to store. We're going to store just the bare minimum. Any duplication, we're going to use um, keys to join between them. And one of the points he makes in his paper, which I think was a, is an excellent paper. You should all go and read it. I think I'll have a link to it later. Um, it's an old paper, but it's, it's still prescient and still relevant today. Uh, the point he's making here is that if performance is a consideration, well, then maybe we can uh, store data differently. But right now, uh, performance is not as big a deal as disk, disk space. So let's optimize for disk space. And one of the great things about uh, the relational paper was that he proposed, oh, I don't know if it was in the paper or not, or he later proposed this, but he proposed a language for querying data. And the language was called alpha. Now, this never really got implemented. It was just sort of a, an idea uh, to provide interoperability and a, a different way to query data than having to know the language that your application is written in. But it went on to be very influential because later on uh, in the 70s, uh, late 70s now, I believe, uh, maybe mid 70s, but uh, there was a, a language called SQL, SQL, that was invented uh, separately from the relational database uh, by two, two guys, Don Chamberlain and Raymond Boyce. This is uh, Don Chamberlain right here. Raymond Boyce, I, I can't find a picture of him. He's, he's no longer with us. But this language is designed to be English friendly. So you don't have to know what language the system was built in to query the data. You could query it with some other English, English friendly language. Have you ever heard of a BCNF, Boyce God Normal Form? You can see uh, God and Boyce right in the name of it there. And once this language becomes available and becomes popular and gets implemented, I believe maybe Oracle or, or Ingress or something was the first one to do it, now the terms relational and SQL become synonyms. But I want to make the point here that they are separated by years. And that SQL doesn't necessarily mean relational. Relational doesn't necessarily mean SQL. But for the most part, these days, we kind of treat them as if they're the same thing. But I I'm, I'm just want to make the point that they're not. And I'm going to drive this point home later. And so relational pretty much owns the database world. Every, I mean, even to this day, relational databases are the most popular used databases for, for all kinds of applications. But when the, when the web started taking off, when, when internet becomes more and more used, you start to get some criticisms and trade-offs that are really starting to surface when it comes to the relational databases. We have much larger scale than computers had seen before. Uh, and so these are some of the criticisms of uh, of relational. So scaling is kind of one of the main ones. And then you also have related to that is performance and inflexibility and impedance mismatch. So just uh, a couple of quick examples of what that means. When I talk about scaling, uh, this means the ability of your database to handle more and more traffic, more load, more operations. So there's two kinds of scaling. Uh, one is vertical scaling. We have our database machine here on the left and we need to scale it to handle more load. So we just Give it a bigger machine, more CPU, more disk space, more RAM, etc. And we keep doing that and we keep going bigger and bigger until we reach some sort of ceiling. Either um, it's just going to cost too much to keep doing it this way or, and or uh, you're going to reach some sort of ceiling when it comes to the speed of your queries uh, when they're coming out of a, a single machine. And uh, the alternative to this that can be used um, with vertical scaling uh, or you can use just by itself is horizontal scaling. So instead of uh, taking our machine and making it a bigger machine, we add more machines and we join them together via networking. So they all work together as one, even though they're separate machines. This is called clustering. So I can keep adding machines as I need to add more capacity uh, to handle more operations. I can keep scaling out horizontally. So those are the two different methods of horizontal of, of scaling. With relational databases, vertical scaling, super easy. Traditionally, super easy to do. With horizontal scaling, it's much more difficult to pull off the horizontal scaling with relational databases. They just weren't designed for this. Uh, this architecture weren't designed for this. People do it. It's, it is done. I'm not going to say it's impossible. It is just more challenging to do. And then I talked about the idea of scaling, hitting a ceiling at some point. There's a, there's a paper here. I'm kind of blocking it. Uh, hopefully there'll be a link, link to it at the end. I'll put a link in the, I'll, I'll make these slides available to you as well. 
um, so you can get, get all the slides, get all the links. But there's a, a paper from the mid 2000s, I think, called "The Free Lunch Is Over," that talks about uh, the, the sort of Moore's law trend that as we're adding more transistors, performance gets better, but we're getting to a point where it's it's leveling off. And now we need to think about distributed computing, and that for databases, that means distributed databases. And then the last one here, this is kind of a side effect of, of uh, relational and NoSQL, is with NoSQL, you have this concept of impedance mismatch. And so uh, on the right there is how you'd store your piece of data, your shopping cart, inside your application. This is a C-sharp example, but you know you get the idea. It's just an, an object that contains some data. And it itself contains a list of items in the shopping cart. But that, the way it's stored in our program is not the way it's stored in our relational database. We have to take it and put it through a paper shredder, essentially, and split it up. And so instead of a shopping cart object, we now have a shopping cart row and two or more rows of shopping cart items. So we have two relations and three pieces of data, whereas in our, in our program, it's just one object containing information. So what we've, what we've done to sort of address this problem is that little arrow in the middle there, uh, known as object relational mappers, ORMs, so tools like Hibernate, Entity Framework, things like that, that try to map the best they can back and forth. And for the most part, they work pretty well. Uh, but there's, there's, you know, there's some percentage of situations where that mismatch just isn't going to be handled very smoothly. And that's one of the criticisms as well. Inflexibility is also kind of related to this. So this is a very simple SQL uh, relational uh, schema here, representing customer and their contacts, their connections, and things like that. If we want to go and change the way this data is stored, we want to add something to this data, we want to make some change to what we're collecting, what we're saving, etc. we have to go in and modify what's called the schema, how we define these tables. So let's just assume a really simple uh, kind of uh, trivial use case here um, is a payment method. So our we might have a, a credit card associated with our customer. So right now, let's say I have a customer column in that customer table. So you can if you uh, so Zach, if you're thinking of like Excel, think of a column in Excel. Uh, but we have to define those columns ahead of time in in relational. And if I want to now, my boss says, okay, we need to accept multiple payment options. Okay, so uh, what I could do is add another column to customer, but that's not a really a good way to go about this because now we can only have two payments. And what if we need three? What if we need four, etc.? So the solution to this is to create a separate table called billing. And each row in the billing table will have credit card information. Now, this is really easy for me to push the button and make that table appear on a PowerPoint slide. But actually doing this in a real system, it takes more effort. You have to create a table. You have to index it properly, hopefully. Create a foreign key back to the customer. Copy that customer data over from customer to billing. And then remove those, excuse me, remove those fields from the customer table. So that's, it. I mean, I'm counting five or six different operations you have to do on the schema just to get that to happen. For a large enough data set or a data set that's being used uh, by enough different people concurrently, this could be an operation that is, uh, can take down your system for some period of time while you make that change. Uh, so you may have to wait till Saturday at 2 a.m. to do it. Or you may have to stage a whole separate database and sync the data between them uh, as much as you can so that you can do a quick flip from one data schema to the other. Uh, so this is a challenging problem with relational databases. And so they're not really designed for uh, the flexibility that we often want or need from our systems. All right, before we get into the questions here, uh, I want to remind you, keep asking your questions there on, on Pigeonhole or in, or in the Twitch chat. Pigeonhole.at slash SQLSAT, all caps there. Uh, I do want to say, because I'm talking to a group of, of people who are, are mostly SQL professionals, I would imagine, or relational database professionals, that I, I just want to say up front that if you're using relational databases right now, if you're a developer and, and they're working fine for you, if you're a DBA and they're working fine for you, then that's fine. Uh, there's no need to change just for the sake of changing. There's no need to change just because it's a cool buzzword that, oh, I want to, I want to play with some new tool. That's not a really good reason. So uh, if, if, you're, if you're not compelled by any of those things yet, scaling, flexibility, uh, performance, if none of those things are really hampering you right now, 
then your relational database is, is going to be fine. Uh, I'm not here to convince you to stop using it. Uh, but I, I will say, you know, don't turn your mind off just yet. Uh, there's some things that NoSQL databases may give you uh, in the future for future projects or when you run into these scaling issues. And, and not all these options are, uh, you know, drop my SQL server and switch to something else. That, that's not the case. It may be part of my system. I move out of SQL server into something else. And we'll, we'll look at some of those use cases here as we go on, uh, if that's what you want to look at. So right now, it is a choose your own adventure time. And I, I mean this literally because I have this slide here containing a bunch of links to different areas of content. So now that you've seen all what I have prepared here, maybe you want to put your preference there in the chat room or in, or in Pigeonhole. You say, oh, I definitely want to explore that part. Oh, I forgot about that. Let me, let me ask about that. So these are all the things... Uh, that I have prepared to show you. I can also show you a little bit of uh, a NoSQL database in action. I have a, a Couchbase server here ready. I could show you some of the basics of if you want to get a feel for what a NoSQL tool might look like without having to install it yourself. It's totally fine. So let me just look at my, my phone here, see some of the questions that, have, that we've written down here. Uh, we've got some comments on these as well. Uh, so, um, okay, so... Yeah, there was a question coming in about, um, we'll get this one out of the way here. Is SQL similar to Excel as far as code? I would say um, not really. Um, spreadsheets and databases are not really the same thing. Uh, it, it, they're, they're, they're very different. And then, then the code you'd use in Excel, I mean, there, you could hypothetically connect an ODBC driver to it and query that with SQL. Um, but oftentimes the code in Excel is, is VBA. So it's, it's, that's a whole different world. Uh, that's not really a database, I guess. All right, uh, other questions come in. So uh, RR Jammy asks, where do I start with MySQL? So this, this, is a, uh, this is meant to be a NoSQL type of session. Uh, so MySQL is a relational database. But I mean, where I'd tell you to start is probably just go to MySQL.com. Uh, you could also just spin up a quick uh, Docker image with MySQL and, and start to connect to that and try it out. Um, some of the cloud providers have MySQL as a service. You could also try those out. Okay, so you can also vote on these questions in Pigeonhole as well. I'm, I'm not showing you on the screen here, but you can view them there yourself on your phone or on your computer. You can vote on ones you like as well. So if there's a, someone else has asked a question that you really want uh, to know about, you can hit the up, up vote in there, up vote button there. So RDBMS versus, uh, versus uh, Couchbase. And J.R. Lawhorn is specifically about indexing. Okay, so maybe we can uh, come back to that because indexing uh, is certainly an important uh, topic there. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, access patterns. Someone asked about access patterns. Okay. Uh, yeah, access patterns. Why don't we start there? That's a good place as any to start. So oh, let's start with the key value access patterns here. So there, there's... There's basically four main types of NoSQL databases. There are a few others as well, but there's four main types. And so I want to talk about key value first. This is probably the most simplest uh, access pattern to think about. And then some databases even have this access pattern. If they're, not, if they're more than just key value, they still might have this access pattern. But basically, think of your database as like this, as a big, uh, a big grid of a key and a value. And the key is associated with the value. So if I want to access a value, I have to know its key. And then I can get that value by saying, I have key one, give me the value that's associated with key one. And I can do the same other, uh, other, other operations with the key. So I can do a set or an insert, sometimes called a replace, which will update the value. Upsert, which will either create it or replace it, depending on if it exists or not. And delete will just remove that row uh, completely by, by the key. So that's the key value access pattern. That's a really, really simple way to access data. Um, and you can do that in document databases, like up here, and key value databases. So let's, let's look at key value here real quick. This is an example, a little better di diagram of key value. Because the, the, the idea with key value is that the value can be anything. It doesn't have to have a specific structure. So it could be JSON data, it could be XML data, it could be text, it could be binary, it could be a series of emojis. But the point is you can, they're all addressable by the key. So if I know the key, I can look them up and I can store whatever I want in there. 
It doesn't have to follow a specific structure. It doesn't even have to follow a, a data type. It just could be a bunch of you know, random letters. Document is kind of similar to key value in the sense that you do have a key still associated with each document, but the documents themselves are following some sort of structure. So in this case, JSON. So I have JSON data in there. So that's what makes it a document database when I have a consistent format to my data. Uh, and then one of the interesting things about documents and, and NoSQL in general is that it's not a relation. The data itself is uh, on its own. So I can have a second document here. And notice they have two different keys, 52109 and 52110. And for the most part, they have the same types of fields in there, name, email, and favorite foods. But notice that Alice there on the right also has an age field. This is allowed in document databases and NoSQL to have data that's mostly the same, but has some differences. And those can all live together. And so we have flexibility there. We can add different fields, we can remove different fields. Now, for the most part, you need to be very disciplined about that. You shouldn't just throw whatever you want in there, right? I shouldn't have name in one and first name in another, for instance. But, I mean, in some cases you might. Some use cases you might be okay with that. You might want that. Uh, and then there's other couple graph and wide column. If you're interested, I can go into those. But those are a little bit outside my expertise, and those are a little different from, from document and key value. And so following on access patterns here, let's look at query. So there's lots of different ways that different NoSQL databases provide for you to query your data. So one of the oldest ways that, that these databases would provide you something like a query is called MapReduce. And, and MapReduce is just a, a type of uh, access pattern or algorithm that's going to go through all the documents, all the pieces of data in your system, and it's going to run some function against them. And it may or may not emit some value from that function. So at that point, you can put some logic inside your, your function. So in this case here, I've got a JavaScript function. It's looking to see, okay, is there a type field? Is the type field equal to landmark? And is there a name field? If so, emit that name and, and the ID. So this is a kind of query. Um, and the results are emitted into a view. And then you can go in and ask the view for results. So the bottom right here, you can see, this is actually a URL right here that I can use to look at that view and, and order it and, and go through and paging, things like that. Uh, so there, th this approach has some benefits in terms of performance and it's really good for distributed data, of course. Um, but it is scattered to every node, so the results have to be gathered up. So there's some drawbacks to this, and, and it's often limited as well. So we can't really do joins like we can do in a relational world. We may not need to do joins. We can talk about that later. Um, and that's often written in JavaScript, which is, you know, it's a popular language, but is it really the best choice for data? Is that really what it's meant for? So this, this method is kind of, it's still around in a lot of NoSQL databases, but it's kind of fallen out of favor. So another approach is a more declarative query. And this is for the NoSQL databases to basically create their own query language or API. So here's a few examples I've pulled from uh, Mongo, Dynamo, and CouchDB. Uh, CouchDB's language is called Mango. Now this approach is a little better, I think, because it's declarative and it can be more ad hoc. So I can create a query on the fly. I don't have to create a function and a view and all those sorts of things. Uh, so I can possibly do things that are kind of like joins or lookups. I can do aggregations, although the exact capabilities are going to vary from database to database, right? And uh, to J.R. Hawthorne's question, these are going to work best when you have indexes for these queries, just like they do in, in the relational world, uh, for them to, to maybe for them to work at all, and certainly for them to perform well. And that's, that's true of relational. Uh, now, this approach is, you know, one of, my, one of my criticisms of this approach is that notice that each of these three different databases have their own language, basically, that you kind of have to learn a new language to query data from them. And they can get a little wordy if you're doing anything a little bit more than, than this complexity here. So, you know, that's, that's a better approach than MapReduce, I think, but I think we can do better. So... Uh, another approach that I like is just using SQL as a language. And this is 
another reason why I don't like the term no sequel because we have sequel in the no sequel world now because many of these so-called no sequel databases are, are using it. And this is a trend that I am on board for. This is why I, I came to Couchbase. This is why I like Couchbase because Couchbase is the leader in this type of querying space. Their language is called Nickel, N1QL. And this was the first implementation of a spec called SQL++. So you can write a query just like up there, select country, select from where, the sort of stuff you would normally see in SQL queries. Uh, another, another database that does this in kind of a very limited way, very, very limited way compared to a full SQL implementation is Cosmos DB. This is from Microsoft. And it's a very, very small subset of the SQL++ spec. And then there's another a sort of experimental language or, or database called Partic Particle, Particuel, I guess. And it is a AWS-backed effort. This is Amazon. Uh, there, they've uh, taken one of the original researchers that worked on SQL++ and they've implemented partic Particle. But it is very, very new right now. So it's not something that, that, that's being used in many places. But I really like this trend for NoSQL because as I said in the very beginning, the SQL, the data world is pretty much dominated by SQL. So why not just, just instead of ignoring that, why not bring SQL on board and make it work with, with NoSQL? Let's see, some more access patterns here I've got. So another one, this is, has to do with uh, Cassandra and, and Wide Table. And if, I don't know if anyone's really expressed much interest in that. So I may want to just, uh, may want to just uh, come back to this later. Um, yeah, okay, so here's, here's a question that came in. Okay, when the differences are there and you query the data, how will it return age when a document doesn't have it? Will it just return nor, null or will the query puke? Okay, so this goes back to the, uh, let me go back here, to the, um, to the document page here. So the, I think this is what you're referring to here, a CHL Smith. Uh, if I query this data and I query the age, What's going to happen when I query that, you know, my query uh, touches that person 5209? Is it going to return null or will the query puke? So what will happen uh, depends on which tool you're using. But I, I will tell you, we could actually demo this if you want to. I will tell you what happens is that they're in, in Couchbase anyway, there's this idea of missing. So missing is different than null. So you can see on the left here, this document is missing an age field. It's not that there's age there and the age has, has a null value, it's just the age is completely missing. So if you select age, uh, it, will just, it, won't, it won't be returned as part of that query It'll, for, the, for that one result. Uh, you'll have name, email, favorite foods, but you won't have age. And the second one, the result will have age in it. So it'll be, it'll be missing. Now, how, when that gets down to your application level, that's gonna depend on how you wanna handle it in your application. So you may wanna just treat that as a null um, in your in your application, and and for the most part, that's what happens. It just becomes a, becomes a null. It's not gonna it's not gonna puke. Um, th that was your question there. Uh, okay, so that good, really good question, really good question. All right. Um, okay, another question. Also, in terms of that document DB pattern, would the extra data in the documents even be useful? Some have it and some don't. Yes, yeah. So the, the, let me go back to this again. Um, some have it and some don't. Would that be useful? Absolutely. Uh, so in my application, uh, I may have, I may be using this for user profile, let's say. Some users may have an age defined, some may not have an age defined. So when I'm loading up that user profile, there may be some logic in my application that says, okay, um, this is, this is a, a website for a, a distillery, for instance, and I'm logging in my user profile and I said, an age is in there. So I can check the age and say, okay, yeah, this person is allowed to view this website. Another person logged in their profile. There's no age defined. So I need to direct them to a page that says, hey, what's your birthday? Or I may say, well, there's no age defined. You can't come into this website, right? So absolutely, there's lots of things you can do with that. And that's the flexibility that this kind of database gives you that uh, that relational not necessarily may not necessarily give you. Now you could have an age column in every single, uh, every single, uh, in the table. So every single 
row would have an age value, whether it's null or not. Um, but that's just a simple case, right? We could have a more complex series of uh, profile information in there. And we may want to just make it experimental. We may want to have half our users can have this data or something like that. So yes, absolutely, there is, there is value to having that. Let's see, Sunny has a question. What about recursive queries? So when you, when you mean recursive queries, um, do you mean like in, in SQL, for instance, I have a recursive query, a query that queries, I like has a subquery, for instance? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That's supported with, with SQL, so therefore it's supported with, with like Couchbase's and Particle's SQL as well. So I could select from and then have a subquery and select from that. Now, you got to be careful with those. All, all, you know, relational or not, you got to be careful with those. With Cosmos, I'm not 100% sure. I think, I think you probably can, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Really good questions coming in. Okay. What else? Um, let's see. What are considered the most basic indexes you need on a document database? So indexes. Let's talk about index. Let's go to performance here. Another, another JR Lawhorn comment. So instead of leaning on DB to find schema with relational, that contract shifts to the application. Yes, absolutely. That's a good way of thinking about it. Absolutely. Now, um, there's a question in here somewhere about schema or lack thereof. We can talk about that as well. Let's go to performance here and talk about that. I know that's important to uh, a lot of DBAs and certainly a lot of uh, SQL uh, developers who are using SQL Server. Because performance, sometimes people think, oh, that's the DBA's problem. They'll handle the performance. I'll just, I just write the queries. Uh, and I don't think that's true. And it certainly is, is true when we're talking about a NoSQL as well. Uh, NoSQL does not mean no DBA. Uh, it's still useful to have someone who can uh, manage and uh, administer the databases and, and help you with uh, querying and indexing, things like that. So I want to talk about performance in general. So oftentimes with NoSQL, people will point to benchmarks. And uh, benchmarks, in my mind, are something that you really you do for yourself. You try something, you benchmark it, you mark it on your bench, you make a change and see how that compares to the mark. If you're building database software, you should automate this as much as possible. And so this is, this is a uh, Couchbase's uh, public benchmarks based on our internal builds. And you can't really see the URL there, but uh, it's show fast sc.couchbase.com, totally public. Uh, and this is just a lot of different variations on performance and, you know, is this version doing better than the last one or is this version doing worse than the last one? So we're, we're testing our database against our database. We're seeing, we made a change, did it make it better? Did it make things worse? These are the most useful benchmarks. The benchmarks that I don't really like very much when people ask me for, hey, do you have some benchmarks um, comparing, you, comparing your database to other databases? And in my point of view, benchmarks are often commissioned and or published by the vendor or by the database uh, project themselves. Uh, and so what they're really asking is, are you faster than some given competitor? Uh, so what you'll see is benchmarks like this. You'll see, oh, look at these, look at these bar charts. Uh, these are the losers, the green ones here. These are the chumps, the yellow ones. And of course, the ones with the best benchmarks are us. We're, all, we're, gonna be the, we're always going to be the best. We're always going to go with us. So that's why I'm suspicious of, of benchmarks. But if the question is really, are you faster than some given competitor? The answer is this. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer, but uh, this is the truth. I'm not saying to ignore those benchmarks. I'm just saying consider the source. Look at the details. Uh, and you might think about doing benchmarks as part of your own proof of concept because you're going to know the workload, the resources, the use cases, which access patterns you're going to use better than, you know, someone else who's trying to give a more general benchmark approach. Uh, and so I also want to talk about uh, architecture. This is an important thing to consider as well. So I'll look at the high-level architecture of whatever database you're using. How does it use uh, memory? Does it have a built-in cache? Or is it using a memory just for buffering? Is it memory only? Is it disk only? If you're deploying to a cloud, uh, which data center are you deploying it to or which data centers? And what's the latency there? Um, how much concurrency does your use case need? And, and then of course the question is what kind of indexes and queries do you need? 
And in relational, we talk about table scans and primary scans. So I'm going to skip past this. No one's really asked about cloud uh, yet. I'm going to skip past that. Um, oh, I think uh, I thought there was something in here about indexing, but uh, maybe not. What else do we got here? Um, I could have sworn I had an indexing uh, indexing um, question somewhere. Data migration query was it in was it in here? It might have been in here. I, I might be past the uh, uh, the Cassandra stuff. Let's see. Yep. That's graph, database, full text search. No, I guess I'd, I I had it somewhere. Let's see. Data migration, scaling, use cases. I think maybe maybe modeling. Maybe it's in modeling. Relational relationship, Y table, key value. No, nope, not there either. Well, I know it's in here somewhere. Um, I can certainly show you an example of it as well. If we don't, if I can't find it, let me just, uh, you know what, I'll just shut down the uh, slide here and do a quick search. Uh, keys or indexes, Postgres, let's see. Oh, hang on, access pattern. I think it's maybe as a footnote. I didn't really go into indexing. I, I guess my thought was that's kind of, I don't know, even in relational world, people aren't uh, as comfortable as, with indexes as they should be. Um, so maybe I, I thought that was going to scare people off putting uh, putting index talk into here. But uh, so let me see if I just review the question here. The most basic indexes you need on a document database. So it really depends on the query that you're writing. Um, the way Couchbase works is that by default, you don't get any indexes. So therefore, your queries will not run by default. And the reason for that is goes back to uh, the, the way that document database is stored. It's all stored together, right? It's not stored in separate tables. So in a relational world, I, have, I could have a small table, a few hundred rows. I could probably get away with not putting an index on there. I really should, but I could get away with it because the worst case, I'm gonna scan a few hundred rows. With a, with a uh, with a, a, a what do you call it a, uh, a full full table scan something like that it's going to scan a few hundred rows not a big deal in a, in a NoSQL database if I scan everything we're talking hundreds of thousands millions of records and doing the equivalent of a full table scan on that it's just it's not going to be good in production so uh, but you can enable those uh, in Couchbase it's called a, a primary index. And it allows you to query every single document, and it's going to scan every single one of them. And it's incredibly slow, useful for development, useful for developers and people trying to write queries to figure out if they're getting the right results, but not good for production. Yes. Okay. Uh, what else we got in here? Questions. Um, all right. Let's see. Can you compare performance between SQL and NoSQL for a relatively large database, say one terabyte? SQL uses indexing to prove performance. Is that the same for NoSQL? Yes. Yes, it's the same. Indexing is extremely important with NoSQL, probably even more so than SQL. But yes, you need to create indexing. Transactions and rollbacks. Okay, I love to talk about this stuff. So let's talk about ACID transactions and rollbacks. So when people ask about ACID, they they're usually asked about transactions, right? There is more to ACID than that. And I've got a whole blog post about this, but we're gonna talk transactions. Why do we need transactions in relational? Well, because the way we model data in relational is something like this. Remember that paper shredder that it goes through. So we don't have a shopping cart as a table. It's really a shopping cart plus related tables like shopping cart items. That's where the items are stored. So if I need to create a shopping cart and add items to it, that all that needs to all happen or none of it happens. So I need, because there's two different relations here, I need to have a transaction so that if something happens, you know, I add the item to the shopping cart, something happens, something goes wrong and it, it, it fails, then I have to roll it back and that item can't be in the shopping cart anymore. So it either all happens or none of it happens. 
And this is extremely important for relational because the data is so split up like this. So we could model the exact same way in a NoSQL database, in a document database, let's say. So for our shopping cart, we have four total documents. We have one, that's the cart, that's the very first one there, and we have three that are items in the cart. We could model it this way. And if you do this, you have the same problem. If I want to update uh, a shopping cart, add an item to it, I have to make all or nothing changes to them. So then, but if you're doing that, my question is, why are you doing it that way? You, you don't have to in a document database. You can model it a different way. So consider modeling it this way instead. Now it's one piece of data instead of four. And this, is, this kind of data is where NoSQL can really shine. We get quick access to structured and semi-structured data without having to assemble it first. So the shopping cart, a user profile, a session store, these are great use cases for NoSQL. We can access the shopping cart as a whole quickly and frequently, and we don't need a transaction to provide the same atomicity here because it's all part of the same piece of data. We can store an array, we can store nested objects, we can store arrays of nested objects, all in one, uh, one piece of data, okay? So that is one option, is that, well, for some cases, we don't need a transaction anymore. We have ACID uh, at a single document level, that's all we really need. Now, that being said, that's not where the story ends. Uh, the question still persists. Uh, in my opinion, that this is sometimes a bit of a security blanket, for developers who want to make the jump, and there are a lot of them, right? So I don't, I'm not trying to disparage this at all, but it, it's, a, it's also a box that managers and decision makers want to tick because maybe their DBAs or their, or their devs or their Oracle salespeople will say, oh, hey, you got to have transactions. You got to have transactions, sign here. Uh, but once you, once you dig in, you're going to hopefully find that you rarely need them. But when you do need them, major NoSQL tools have started to provide them. So here's a few, uh, sorry, a few examples right here. So Mongo just added this in, uh, in version four. Couchbase has added this in version 6.5. And Raven has had it for a while. There's others out, out there with similar capabilities. The thing is, ACID is a very tricky thing. It's not like there's a standards body that defines what ACID is and certifies compliance or anything like that. Uh, the closest is probably Jepson uh, that does that. Uh, but even for relational databases, there's not like a, an ACID standard. There's lots of different variations of it. There are most definitely trade-offs here because of the distributed nature. But if you have been worried about or afraid of trying NoSQL or jumping into NoSQL because they don't have ACID, they don't have transactions, well, th that has changed. They are available uh, for many of the NoSQL databases out there. So I hope, hope that answers your question. I don't have a... Uh, a, a really good example to show you right now of, of I mean, I do, but it'll take me a while to set it up. Um, but uh, it's just kind of boring. It's just like start transaction, insert data, commit transaction. Uh, and so, I mean, if, if you're worried about, does it, does it exist? Yes, it does. It, it does exist. Let's see, what else? Questions have come in here. Uh, let's see, a concrete example. Is this a question or a comment? Uh, let's see, a lookup table. Let's say time zones. I have 200 records in the relational table. If I move that to a document database, would I put all those time zones in the same document? Okay, um, interesting. So, uh, it, like if you have a lookup table of time zones, uh, put them all in the same document? Uh, maybe, maybe. It depends on how you're going to be using those time zones in your queries or in your lookups. Um, yeah, so you may want to put them all in one, one document because, you know, m most document databases have a limit how much you can put into a single document. Uh, I think time zones would be under that limit. It would be no problem to put them all there. Um, but it depends on your queries. Uh, but here's another, here's another something to think about. Uh, it doesn't have to be one or the other. You could do both. You could have one document with all the time zones, and you could have each, uh, each uh, time zone in its own individual document and use one or the other, depending on which is better for your access pattern. And now you might say, oh no, I'm storing duplicate data, it's going to get out of sync. Uh, it, that's possible, right? So you need to be more prepared for that. But there are some ways that you can 
uh, think of one document as a source of truth, and when that gets updated, it fans out to the other documents. Uh, that's, that's something that could totally be done in, in many NoSQL databases these days. Let's see, what else has come in? Uh, let's see, we got uh, the extra data, the age, and we covered that stuff, recursive queries, yep. Can you speak to using NoSQL functionality in a relational database, such as storing JSON and XML in a column in SQL Server versus pivoting to a solution that was built to handle semi-structured data? So that's this one right here. JSON in Postgres. I, I say Postgres here because I think Postgres probably has the strongest JSON in a relational database story. <coughs> so now we're talking about, instead of SQL++, we're talking about SQL 2016. And SQL 2016 has introduced a set of functions that can be used to manipulate JSON data. So I don't, I don't think anyone's really following this to the letter, uh, to the standard just yet, but Postgres seems to be the best implementation so far. Newer versions of SQL Server and MySQL have some of this too. So basically the question is, if I can store and manipulate JSON in a relational database, isn't this just the new NoSQL? Can I just use Postgres instead? Um, and this is an example of some of the functions you might use to deal with JSON data, like a JSON array, JSON object, et cetera. Uh, yes. Yep, let's just pack it up and go home. No, no, of course, of course not. That's not the real answer. No, the real answer is this. <laughs> to every question in computers, this is the answer. It depends and it's complicated. Um, it might work for you. Right? But there, you need to look into it at, at, more, at a deeper level. And so um, what I want to uh, give you is a link to this, this guy here. He wrote a, a complete analysis and opinion and, uh, about uh, comparing Postgres, JSONB versus NoSQL. And now you might be thinking, hey, wait a minute, that's a Couchbase link. So obviously it's going to trash Postgres, right? Well, that's far from it, right? It's actually been a very popular and well-received piece. It's even been touted by the Postgres community. So some things you want to think about when it comes to JSON in a relational, uh, relational table is that there's querying limits and you have to think about indexing. Can you index in the same way that you can in NoSQL database? Uh, what's the tooling like there? Is there good tooling to handle JSON in those databases yet. Uh, documentation, it may, may not be very well documented, right? It's just very much an emerging standard and no one's really following it to the letter, so you have to lean on documentation for that. And, and further, I'd say, um, uh, what was I gonna say here? Um, Don Chamberlain, yes, I wanted to say, yeah, Don Chamberlain. This is a picture of Don Chamberlain standing next to a picture of himself. Uh, but he is the, uh, he's the co-creator of SQL, right? I mentioned him early on in the session. He also has weighed in on SQL 2016 versus SQL++. And so definitely check that out. That's bit.ly slash comparing SQL. I'll put that link there in the chat. So if you want to click on it right now, you can. But I, I will just say a bit of a, a, a summary here is that uh, Don Chamberlain, the co-creator of SQL, is also a, a tech advisor at uh, Couchbase. Uh, so we're, we're very much at Couchbase. We're very much in favor of SQL uh, and, and SQL++ specifically. But uh, definitely, that's a, that's a full paper there comparing the pros and cons of uh, SQL 2016 versus SQL++. So that's going to give you a little bit better insight. And I, I say another thing I want you to do, if you want to explore this some more, I'd recommend taking a look at something called Martin. So if any of you are .NET developers, since this is a SQL pass, you probably are uh, familiar with .NET. Um, and this is kind of a way to wrap Postgres to make it look like a NoSQL database. Uh, and there's some other efforts out there like this. But keep in mind, this is Postgres behind the scenes. So this may address the idea of storing JSON flexible, a flexible way, but does it address the core issue of scaling and performance that kind of drove NoSQL in the first place? So if all you really want is a way to store JSON and get the flexibility of JSON and your scale is not that big, this might be a perfectly good solution for you, is using SQL Server or Postgres JSON capabilities. So really good question there, yes. Very good. All right, what else has come in? 
Um, so I think I've got all the questions. I really appreciate everybody asking these questions here. Parquet and Avro imports, uh, says Sonny. Uh, I don't know much about, uh, a bunch, much about Avro imports, but I, I do recognize that. Um, let's go here. Data migration synchronization. So you want to move data from one database into a NoSQL database. And this is a really serious why. Uh, why do you want to do that? What are you hoping to gain by doing that? So going back to those, those core reasons for NoSQL, is it scalability? Is it high availability? Is it performance? Is it offloading like an older mainframe? Then yes, okay, let's do it. That's a good reason to migrate or synchronize data. Um, if you don't want to pay Oracle anymore, if you, if you just want to save some money, all right, maybe we can look into it. If it's just flexibility that you want, and this is just what I said with, with Postgres and SQL Server. I, I think maybe you need to be careful about that because you might, uh, it might not be worth the trade-off just yet. Uh, so let's, let's look at your use case a little closer. Let's do a proof of concept to see if it really helps. Uh, and finally, if you just want to put NoSQL on your resume, mm, nope, that's not a good reason. So consider your architecture, your use case uh, benefits. So I'm going to get to the Avro thing, I promise you. Uh, relational databases, they're kind of like a Swiss army knife, all right? You can make them do just about anything, right? But a professional chef is not going to use a Swiss army knife. She's going to use the, you know, a selection of different knives, the best tool that she can, right? A carpenter is not going to use the screwdriver on, on a Swiss army knife uh, to build a house, right? So you, you can make it work, uh, but if you're having those problems, maybe consider using a different database alongside your relational. So Instead, let's, let's offload user profile onto NoSQL and everything else can stay in relational for now and we'll see how that goes. User profile, maybe that's where we have the, the biggest performance or scalability issues or flexibility issues. So let's try it just there. Move just that one part, that one slice. If you're, if you're building microservices already, this becomes a lot easier to do. Okay, and there are some tools to help you actually move data around. And this is, what, this is the, like the one little bit of Avro stuff that I know. Uh, there is a tool out there called Apache NiFi, and it is a tool that is a, um, it's like a da data flow visualization tool. And one of the formats it uses internally is Avro. And so um, if your NoSQL database that you want to explore has a NiFi connector, then yeah, you can get into Avro format, which can then go into like Hadoop or, um, you, you know, I worked on a project with the Cincinnati Reds, actually, here at Couchbase. And they're, they're using NiFi throughout their whole organization to move data around. And so they wanted to move data from SQL Server into Couchbase. And there is a Couchbase NiFi connector. There's a NiFi connector for just about everything, by the way. Um, but th other tools you could use, uh, SSIS. You can mi migrate data to and from using SSIS. Uh, Kafka, uh, Talend, Golden Gate. There's lots of other tools around there. Um, but Understanding the data model is important, right? Because if we're just moving from relational to NoSQL, we're going to end up with that shopping cart situation from before where, yes, we can do it. Is this going to be the best way? Might be a great place to start. Absolutely. Just keep it apples to apples. But then start to embrace the differences in NoSQL and, and make those changes to your model as you can. Okay. So that's, that's all I really know about Avro. So sorry, I don't know much about that. Which NoSQL databases are queryable with Spark? I mean, many of them, as far as I know. I know that uh, Couchbase, we have a Spark connector. Um, I guess the question then would be, what is it about Spark that you want to, to do that you can't do with the query capabilities that are built into the database? And that would probably be where I'd start with that question. I don't have a Spark um, slide here. So here, we'll go to the something else I didn't think of. I don't, I, don't, I don't have a Spark slide, but I know Couchbase has a Spark connector. I think Cosmos does now as well. I'm sure Mongo has one, et cetera. But what do you, what do you want to do with the, with the Spark uh, querying that you can't do with the language built in? Because there may be a different way to go about it. You may not have to involve Spark, unless there's you know, a good reason. You want, you want Spark involved, which would be totally fine. What are the situations you'd recommend NoSQL versus SQL? This is a tough question. Uh, I'll click on the use cases here, and we're running a little low on time, so this might be the last one. Uh, I'll wrap up, but I'll keep answering questions here as long as you're in the, in the channel. 
uh, watching. I'll keep answering them, but I, I want to wrap up. I want to be respectful of your, of your time. I've asked for a big commitment already of an hour, so we're getting to that point. It used to be that NoSQL use cases were somewhat narrow, somewhat limited. But as I've hopefully uh, showed you that the different methods of querying data, the different methods of storing data, they've really expanded the kinds of things that NoSQL can be really good at. So this is a list of use cases, uh, and I've, I've borrowed heavily from some of the uh, Couchbase customer list of what they're doing with Couchbase. But these are true for a lot of other NoSQL databases as well. So those, those first three there, caching, session, user profile, those are kind of like the killer apps for NoSQL. Especially, you're talking about a distributed environment, with multiple web servers, caching, session, absolutely great. Couchbase especially, it's a memory first database, uh, or, or it can be memory only, but that's going to be very high performance, and you can store structured JSON data in there, and that's great for caching, great for session. And user profile, users' profiles often accessed every time a page refreshes. So it's a great place to inject a little bit of uh, a faster uh, NoSQL with specific access patterns. But then we look at the flexibility, and we think, see things like catalogs and content management. You know, if you think about uh, inventory at, uh, I don't know, Kroger or Amazon or uh, Tommy Hilfiger, their inventory is not um, uniform. Right, so you may have uh, an item in inventory that has a shirt size, but that doesn't really make sense for socks to have a shirt size, right? So now you can have the ability to have different types of fields and different types of data structures depending on the different items in your catalog. So it doesn't have to all fit into one table or a bunch of you know weirdly sort of awkward like fifth normal form style tables. You can store that in a way that makes sense in JSON. And you can just query the catalog uh, and use that and, and search it and query it and display it to the user in the web page. Uh, and then when they actually get to making a purchase, maybe you still rely on your mainframe or your relational database for that. Uh, and I, so I'm just trying to make the point again here that you don't, it doesn't have to be all, all or nothing. You can use a little NoSQL here, a little relational here, and they can all work together. Uh, IoT and um, mobile. We, someone had a question about that. Maybe I'll get maybe I'll get to that if we have time after the summary here. But now we're even talking about. I mentioned asset transactions. We're even talking about finance getting into NoSQL. And you know, if you come from a world of finance, you might know already that it's not as transactional as you might hope it would be. <laughs> it's actually uh, pretty close to the way you would handle things in NoSQL already in the real world, uh, which may not be very comforting to know that your ATM machine is not transactional, but uh, that's, that's just the reality of things. But lots of other things. Travel is, a, is one that's being hit really hard right now, but a lot of, a lot of uh, Couchbase customers are in the travel reservation uh, uh, loyalty program business. Fraud monitoring, gaming is an, another great use case for NoSQL. And that kind of turns into mobile. Mainframe offloading. A lot of times, companies have huge investments in their mainframes, or AS400 or whatever. Those machines are tied into you know, really mission critical things, but they're, it's not a system you want to expose to the web. So put in a NoSQL database to act as like a go-between to offload from the mainframe to handle you know, the, the real load on the website. And you can keep the mainframe around for now. Um, so you don't have to make that big expensive transformation. Okay, uh, I will go to the summary now just to wrap up. We're, we're coming up on time here. But like I said, I will, I will stick around to answer any more questions that come in. So you don't have to leave. I will, I will keep going here, but I want to I wanna just close up here. Uh, just remind you of the, of the few things, how we got here. It kind of all started with scaling. NoSQL was designed to, to solve or address a scaling problem. It has evolved and matured a lot since then, but the core issue is still scale. NoSQL is a lousy buzzword. Uh, let's drill down on that. Let's be more specific about what we mean by NoSQL. NoSQL databases can still use SQL. Uh, and so all it really means is that databases are not one size fits all. Think about the why. This is important. What database problems do you have? Are they scaling? flexibility and performance, and what would help you solve them. Do a proof of concept and try it out. Don't do it just because it's a cool new buzzword, but actually try it out. See, is this going to help us? 
Is this going to be better? Uh, if anything looks interesting to you, you have questions or feedback, I will be hanging out here in Twitch for a while. You can talk to me afterwards. It'll be a little less formal, right? But I want to hear from you. And my, my boss says it's, it's uh, my job to listen to you. So uh, now's your chance if you want to be heard. Uh, Matthew.Groves at Couchbase.com. I'm blocking the email address, but you can see it there. This is my, uh, my family on our uh, last cruise that we went on to Alaska. And I was supposed to be on a cruise here in a couple weeks with my family having a good time, but uh, clearly the world had other, other ideas for us. Some next steps for you. If you want to learn more about Couchbase, I would encourage you to. It's a free download. It's not going to cost you anything to try it out. Uh, Couchbase.com slash downloads. There's also a community edition that's totally free for production. Some free training available. Upcoming events is probably a little tricky right now. Some of these are, are virtual events. Uh, I do a lot of writing at the blog, blog.couchbase.com. And uh, also, if you have tech questions, you can ask in the forums there, forums.couchbase.com. So, uh, it's a Saturday morning here where I am, 945, and you all have been amazing, asking great questions, being really interactive, uh, and these really tense times. There's other stuff you could be doing, but you chose to spend some time hanging out with me, and I want to say I really appreciate that. I, I really just want to thank you very much for hanging out and, and being such a great... Uh, uh, making this such a great session. So thank you very much. Um, I, I, I want to give you all a round of applause for, for showing up today and uh, asking great questions. But uh, So that's the end of the session. Uh, that's what's going to be recorded. That's what I'm going to publish. I'm going to go back here to this main page. So if anyone wants to hang out with me and I can go through some more questions, happy to do so.